economies of scale put uh, local agriculture at an, an incredible disadvantage uh, uh, because big corporations using mechanized uh, techniques and pesticides and herbicides and all of those things that you um, alluded to um, uh, make it very difficult for you to compete. Um, but mechanized agriculture is heavily subsidized by the U.S. federal government. Billions and billions of dollars um, are used to promote that paradigm. And every time uh, there's been a proposal to eliminate agricultural subsidies, um, uh, it's been uh, defeated. So, um, uh, you know, do, do you uh, think that uh, we need to continue to uh, press our politicians on ending uh, subsidies, uh, uh, farm subsidies, or um, is that a political battle that is, uh, there's no possible way of winning that? It's education. It's very possible to win, but it's education. It's education of the masses, because those subsidies are what are at the root of, um, of most of the chronic disease that we have in this country. Uh, diabetes. Uh, the preventable diabetes. Those subsidies, you can argue, are at the root of that because it subsidizes the kind of food, the, the, we call it frank, uh, franken food. It's just goofy stuff that really isn't food. Uh, you know, corn fed beef, uh, chickens that are raised in horrendous uh, situation. Um, how do you change that? The only way to change it is to educate the people and say, you know, we've, we're fed up. The cost, I mean, we're subsidizing that production on the one hand, and then we are uh, paying the health care for the results of it. I mean, it's, it's just the most absurd situation. And the only way that you can overcome that is education. And so absolutely, with the politicians, with, with everybody, we need to cry out. And there's a groundswell starting in this country to make that change. Uh, but it takes everybody. And, and how do you do it? Do you just call your politician? Is that the only solution? That's probably the least solution. The solution is, what do you do with your dollars? At the, that's, that's it. You just say, I'm not going to buy that crap anymore. I'm not going to buy it. I'm going to buy real food, and I'm going to buy it local. And, and, if, and if I can't find a farm, I'm going to try to get a group together to where somebody will do a farm, and then we support them. That's really the only solution. And in the long run, it's actually the, the smartest economic solution. Absolutely the smartest economic solution. Because when you start looking at all the factors, you're actually going to put the money back in your pocket. It's an investment, literally an investment, to get the community to make that change. And as soon as you start voting with your dollars, the only power that the big corporations have, their power is not in their relationships with the government. And there's many arguments that say that it's one and the same. It's a revolving door. The CEO, or maybe not the CEO, but certainly some of the high officials in Monsanto, for example, are the same ones that are in D FDA, and then, then they go from FDA back. Well, goodness sakes, uh, certainly we're gonna have GMO, you know? because the government and the big corporation, it's, it's all the same. It's absolutely all the same. How do you cut the lifeline of that? You stop buying it. And then you solve 
the, the revolving door, you, you solve the, the, the corporate um, irresponsibility, and you actually take care of your family for the long term. And so it's, 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 it just has to come down to a personal decision that, you know what, we're just not going to put up with this anymore. And so, but the thing is, is, is so many of us will talk that line, and then where do, where do you find us when we've got to buy food or buy an appliance or the iPad or the, you know, whatever it is? Where do you find us? Down there, okay, what's the cheapest price? You know, what can I do here? You know, and so we're all hypocrites in that sense. And so we just got to say, we're not going to do that anymore. I mean, that's, that's, there is no other solution. There, that's the only solution. Is there another solution? That's the only one. The president of National Organization for Raw Materials, and we've talked about this for 75 years. Um, today, the topic is exactly this. Where it's become so bad over seven decades in farming that um, it, this is what we're reduced to. We're reduced to having to learn these skills all over again, how many communities can feed themselves. Can you feed yourself? Can you grow your own tomato plant? No. You know, well, that's why you need this man. Yeah. And what he's done, you know, that's uh, uh, how many people can can either rebuild a bicycle or build a new cabinet. You know, these the the center for the the recovery and education of these skills and for uh, uh, the elevation of the community as a result of that, and the sharing and the establishment of that community and the elevation of the community as a whole, is exactly what that is all about. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And uh, for us, you know, we're, we're sitting here uh, with a CSA that services, you know, vacillates between like 350 and 500 shares, which is fairly significant, especially in the state of Utah. I mean, there's other ones much bigger than that. But, you know, we're servicing in Park City, uh, Salt Lake County, Utah County. 350 people out of how many? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's absurd. It really is absurd. And what little we're doing, I mean, it's, it's, it's significant, but it doesn't mean anything either at the same time. And so on food, what do we really need? We need producers. But I'll tell you what, every one of you needs to be a producer in your own backyard. Learn how to garden, for crying out loud. Because it's important. It's important because the food that you can produce is going to be so much better than the junk that you're getting at the store that there's no comparison to it. And there's one other factor that you have to think about, and that is this. There are three million people on the Wasatch Front. What happens if the border closes? What are we going to eat? Hay? I mean, that's the only thing that's produced around here, for crying out loud. You talk about putting your, 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 yourself and your family at risk, and we think about homeland security, you know, we're, we're at risk from the terrorists. It's absurd. We're at risk that we won't have anything to eat. And we set up a society and a system that is absolutely, sooner or later, going to cause famine. You watch. And so... What do you want to do? You better be able to grow it and grow it year-round. The technology is there. You can do it on a, in your yard. If you, if you don't have some dirt, do it on your deck. I mean, there's just there's things to do. But you have to come outside of your comfort zone and do it. It's just something that you've got to do. You just, you just have to do it. And out of that, if people start doing that, there's going to be somebody that goes, well, I like this, you know, and so maybe you start producing for other people. But it's a grassroots situation that, and if you don't have that, then how are you going to vote with your pocketbook? Because there's only one name on the ballot right now. And so, guaranteed, all you're doing is just, you're, we, I shouldn't say you, we, we're just continuing the status quo. And, and so it starts, 
you know, we, we talk about it starts with community. Well, a community is individuals. That's where it starts, really. And this is where some of these ideas that I was, I was throwing out there, this is exactly where we're coming from, and this is right on that same line. You know, you, you've got the person who's producing, right? So you've got your farm who's producing, but also under the same idea, like you're learning how to do these things that you're also buying. So you're learning how, in this case, you're learning how to grow your food, and you're building that relationship and that proximity, and you're building these connections within that community. And so, yeah, just, I think on all levels, whether it's food or whether whatever it happens to be, I think that that production is, is essential to whatever it may be. Okay, this is just a simple little question, but one that stood out to me. I love eating organic food because I thought that it's just the top notch, right? <laughs> Apparently I was wrong. I, I didn't know the severity of the situation. But well, it's probably better than the alternative, you know. Okay. I mean, I mean, I mean it is food, better, you know. It's like Franken food light. Is that what you <laughs> yeah. label it as? Well, know. yeah, depending on which, what it is, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, for someone that likes to eat that way, what would you recommend for them? If, if I mean, I'm a student, I have a little bit of area, I can grow something, but I mean, I, I like eating a, a variety of organic things. So, is there a well, what do you tell somebody like that that lives here that doesn't grow anything besides hay? I mean, that, that in this whole area, it seems like it's just all grown hay. That's what you yeah, tell Yeah, it is. It's the only so thing what would you tell somebody as far as someone that feels that way? Well, um, there's gardening classes. Right. Uh, kind of our next phase, what we want to do, we have to stabilize the farm so we can actually survive. But the next phase for me is is to try to move agriculture to the micro scale, the family size, and, and get people the information and the, the technology and the tools to be able to do it. Because, you know, once you understand it, it's like, okay, I need to do this because I can't, I can't depend on somebody else getting me the food. I don't even know what the organic is. Even now, in the last 10 years, you know, going on that same labeling, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I could go into a Walmart or any other store and go to the produce section and see who was a producer. And I know most all of them because I've, I've worked with all of them. I know all the producers. I know where their farms are. I know what they do. I know how they do it. And so I'd get the name. Now, 10 years later, you can't even figure out who the producer was. The only thing that's on there that you know is it's produce of Mexico. And so you know it comes out of Mexico, but you don't know who the producer is because now the, the, the label on it is just the distributor. It's not required to have who the grower is. So uh, based on who the distributor is, I can pretty much still know who, who it is. But how in the world would you ever know that? You'd never know. And so if you really wanted to even check up and see, you know, where did my food come from? There's not even a track in there. There used to be, but now there's not even a track into there. And so more reason to get it local and to produce it yourself if you can. Yeah. All right. I have a... I have a question and kind of a, a statement, too. I wonder, like, I'm not a fan of subsidies at all, but I think if we took them away, it would cause the famine. And I'm wondering if you know of any legislation that is moving the subsidized from the big monocultures to more local farms, because I can see that as one solution as getting it going. Um, really, my philosophy is no subsidies. I think that the subsidies, very well intentioned, especially initially, they always miss the mark. Always. I mean, they always miss the mark. And so those good intentions to try to drive those in some way, they, they, given that they always miss the mark, it's best just to, to do away. And you're right, I mean, you couldn't just chop it off immediately, but over a couple year period, you certainly could do that. What would happen is, is if you didn't have those subsidies, 
you couldn't buy a bag of chips for for a buck fifty or two dollars. They're going to be five bucks, which would make people scream because you know they want their chips or whatever it is. Yeah. But if if you cut that off, you know where everything that's made with corn syrup, all those prices go to the place they're supposed to be. Then do we have a problem staying in business or or, or, or expanding the farm? Absolutely not, because the economy just pushes it right there because it makes so much sense. And so the sooner we can get rid of the subsidies, the better. And I don't think anybody, in our case, we're not looking for subsidies. In fact, there's programs out there to help the farmer, like, you know, to try to uh, uh, get more, you know, farms. I haven't even taken advantage of any of those because it just ticks me off because I, I, I just feel like, you know, why am I going to go take a, you know, a USDA, whatever it is, you know, to prop me up or whatever. I'm more of the philosophy, let's just get in there, try to get the community involved, and let's just do it. And so subsidies, that's a, I, just, I just hate them. I just hate them because they just always miss the mark. I, just don't, I don't know of one that hits the mark. Yeah, and I think that was kind of my point is just correcting the mark if it could be. But, and then on to my next point is, um, since there is a huge problem with no one knowing how to farm, I wonder if, with your er earlier statement of not having enough labor, if you two can get together, set up a volunteer organization to help you out, and you just teach the volunteers a little bit. Yeah, I, th I think that that's, that's a really good model going forward. I, I think that works. Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult one to, to, to actually make work in, in practice because... Um, We've, we've had the experience, we've had people come down want to help and want to learn, but they don't follow through. And so, but that's human nature, you know, it's just, it's just human nature. And so if they're not really vested in there, uh, and it's, you know, if they don't do it, there's a consequence, then there's so many distractions in life that all those intentions just don't, don't happen. And so... Um, we always tell everybody, you want to come, just come down. There, there's always work. And we've had people that have, you know, gone for, a, you know, more than one time. You know, they've come several times. And some of them ask lots of questions and are really there to learn. And I love that. Uh, others, um, you know, the fact that they came is good, you know. But in practice, it doesn't, it doesn't work that well. You know, I'm, we're just, um, we, we let distractions rule our lives. I mean, it's just kind of the way it is. And that's, that, that's another topic that, you know, from, from another standpoint, you know. But, it's, but it ties into this, for sure. Well, I think Very good the, question. I think the idea of volunteering is one thing, but the idea of an apprenticeship. Right, wrapping our minds around that idea, I think that's really where there's an obligation. Where there's an obligation, yeah. right, yeah. right, and where you yeah. don't have, well, I'm trying to go to school and I'm trying to do a, a job and I'm trying to take care of my family, and now I'm going to go volunteer down at the farm, right, or volunteer wherever. Um, but when you have an, an actual apprenticeship and there's an obligation there, then I think that you can. I think what you're, you're on the right track there with that idea. Yeah. Um, but it, it really is what you're saying about that obligation, about uh, getting some form of a buy-in to make it work. So. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually a question for both of you. I was just wondering um, how what, or what role the internet could play. This thing that's typically viewed, I think, as something that connects people globally with local efforts. Um, just to contextualize a little bit, um, I make documentary films, and I just recently funded um, a series I'm working on through Kickstarter, mm -hmm. which is a crowdfunding platform which allows you to basically raise money from a whole bunch of individuals to, to instead of instead of going to one big producer and getting you know, whatever chunk of money you need, you go to a whole bunch of five dollar, ten dollar donors and try to raise the money for your your project. And I was wondering if there's many, maybe some good uh, sites that are already out there, or if there's there's ways you think that the internet can be helpful in tying people together locally, not only to make people aware of your product, but also ho to hopefully maybe give you startup costs or help fund some of the, your efforts as well. Yes, yeah, so if I go with that, yeah. 
Cool. So what we found is, so we, we run a website. Again, this is on the, the bicycle effort end of things, right? Um, so we run a website. We get about 15,000 views a month, which, you know, isn't bad. It's it's very, very specific, you know, bicycling in Provo website. So 15,000 views isn't bad. Um, we've, got a, we've got a few Facebook pages floating around for different types of groups that are within that community. Um, we've got an email list with over five, 600 people. And I think that there's definitely a lot there that's valid, right? The internet obviously is a great way to connect people and a great way to educate people. But the thing that I found is still nothing beats foot to pavement. Um, as far as the type of education, at least in what we're working with, the type of education that we're doing, nothing beats that. Nothing beats community forum, like a physical community forum. And we've tried like having a wiki page and we've tried having like, you know, uh, you know, with that idea that, you know, people are on computers a lot, let's use the internet more. Um, we've tried to have kind of like a group online chat room thing happening. And it just, again, I, we've found that, at least for us, uh, foot to pavement is the best way to go. But sites like Kickstarter are incredible. And I think through that, that's one way definitely that, that digital and social media works really, really well because you get this, this point where you can just, everybody telling their friends on the Facebook and all that, and uh, they're, they're able to do the, the 5 or $10 donations. So I think there's definitely a lot of room there. But I think that, I think both of us, it's, it's a really, it's a very physical thing, uh, whatever it happens to be. Because again, you can't, you know, you can't, you can't, uh, you know, uh, pull crops over, over the internet, you know what I mean? Again, you can't hammer a nail over the phone. And so it, it still requires people being there, and it still requires that, that physical aspect. Um, but we found, at least for the website, the website's great because we announce events and things like that, but it's usually word, word of mouth that anything happens. But really what the website we found is great, great for is, is showing what's going on other places, right? To kind of bolster up and excite and inspire people. And that's really the main, we found with the digital media, that's, that's what's worked the best. Well, we've, we've, we've found really great value in the internet because um, ours is a membership organization, essentially. And so uh, we're able to, uh, we actually build a system so that people can log in they can defer weeks, like if they're not going to be here, then they can defer the week so that they don't get delivery. Um, they can um, um, change their pickup location. And so that frees us. We don't have to take all that information. The person just logs in. In fact, I, I think we've got a couple. The one, the one person that asked the one question, he's one of our members, and, and you're one of our members too, aren't you? And so you've, you've logged into our site, haven't you? And, and so you can change pickup location. You can change, uh, you know, whether you want the, the food this week or not. And so that's 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 huge, you know, to use those kind of technologies because uh, then we can just concentrate on farming, you know, uh, and and systems. I mean, that, that's where systems are so great, you know, to take care of that kind of a management thing, but you know, the systems they can't grow the carrot, you know, or the or the tomato. But if you can get all that management stuff, you know, high tech, wow, that's, that's huge. And then also, uh, you know, uh, having the website where people can come and see, you know, what is it you're doing. Uh, we, we, get, we get people from far away, not just locally, that have been on our site. And, wow, I wish you could deliver, you know, food to uh, Texas, you know. Well, you know, that's not going to happen, you know. You need to find something <laughs> in Texas. So there's, yeah. Um, we haven't taken advantage of, of uh, you know, raising some capital. And like right now, we're, you know, as we're building this new, new building, uh, you know, I've had to use a lot of my own capital. You know, I keep putting capital in, put, keep putting capital in, capital in, hoping someday that we'll actually get the capital out. Uh, but we, we probably should... Uh, spend some effort on something like that where where people can donate five ten bucks which doesn't really hurt but over thousands of those people can really make a difference in in the community and there's probably a lot of people out there that'd be more than willing to do that if they just knew and uh, so I'd, I'd love to talk to you to see how we could implement that better to us because it would it would take a lot of stress off from me, which would make make things better really for everybody. So, yeah, I think that'd be that'd be great because I think we're probably using the internet 
some fraction <laughs> as to what we really could. So yeah, that's a good suggestion. And just on that note of funding, just real fast, uh, if you, you know, if, if, if anything we say here makes you want to do something or move forward with something, just be ready to put a lot of time into it. <laughs> You're just going to invest a lot of time. Like he says, you know, it's, it's coming out of his pocket. A lot of what we do just comes out of my pocket and that's just the way it is. But, uh, but it, but it works out for the best. So <laughs> thing is somebody's got to do it. Yeah, exactly. You know, somebody's got to do it. Cause exactly. if, if you don't, then you know, that ballot, it's, it just has one place to vote. There's only one place to vote. And the only way that you get another vote is for somebody just to rise up and say, you know, I'm, I'm fed up with this. I'm going to make a change. I was wondering, um, I don't know if something similar to this exists, but, uh, or what your land situation is out there at Jacob's Cove, but um, would you have any interest in like creating like a partnership with UVU in a sense that, um, I, I mean, you could up student fees by a dollar each semester have thirty, twenty to thirty thousand dollars go to like maybe purchase a part of land near your farm, and then have like a subsidized student price, um, so it could be a little more affordable for college students. Um, and then there could also be like classes and stuff specifically for UVU students, or you know, I, I don't know if you want to deal with something. Oh, I, th like that. I would love to do that. I would love to do that, but you know, how you get that thing through, I'm not sure. That would be. Monumental, but that would yeah. be great. I mean, we're, we're doing a similar thing with 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 Zango, but on a very very small scale, where Zango de decided that they wanted to offer, you know, good food to their employees, and so uh, the employees had the option the option to sign up to get the weekly deliveries, and Zango paid the upfront cost. And then just takes it out of their paycheck, you know, every, every pay period, so they don't have to come up with the full cost. And then by them, us just having to deal with one entity that was just going to pay for it, then we were able to give extra weeks for the same price. And so it's kind of a win win. And then we go to Zango every Thursday and do a delivery. And so we go right to the right there and do the delivery. They don't even have to come to the farm or they don't have to go to one of the other established locations we go right there to do that so you know UVU if, if that could be organized I think that'd be a, a, a great thing it'd be a great statement and it could be a great uh, uh, training ground as well uh, to do something like that I'd, I'd love to do something like that I think that'd be more valuable than me teaching physics you know for UVU <laughs> so uh, my comment here is on the uh, volunteer labor of the, and it, to some degree with the suggestion that was just made, um, I'd like not to sound too too pessimistic about it, but remind yourself that the laborer is worthy of his hire. Nothing feels better than when the farmer can hire somebody to help in the greenhouse do this job and pay them for their work. Yeah. To hire someone to help build cabinets and to pay them for their productive work is a satisfaction. In order to pay that, I'm not saying that there's no opportunity for volunteering. That should always exist. But to hire someone to get work done if you want it done, how do you get it done? You pay somebody to do it. And really, the, the volunteering doesn't work really well. Correct. It, it, it has to be a, like an apprenticeship yeah. because, I mean, why are you volunteering except to try to get some value? Because anything that doesn't have some, some value component to it, it just kind of falls through. You know, it just it doesn't work. And so what you're saying is exactly right. I mean, it's just a laborer. Uh, worthy of their hire mm -hmm. and and an apprentice worthy of their work and their learning That's uh, right. and, and, and it's value e either way it's it's a, a transfer of value and that's the way it should be and that's the healthy yes the healthy way that it should be Absolutely. And what what that means is that 
it gets to the circulation of money, uh, which becomes the kind of the Achilles heel of most of these schemes, you wind up having to essentially invent, if the rest of the economy gets worse, you wind up having to invent a local currency or a way to exchange these values without having to use uh, the coin of the realm. That's kind of where it goes. Because you need to pay attention to the calculation of the proper price. If you're going to make your vote local, high quality, make sure you're casting a full vote. That your dollar buys what the farmer needs to purchase, and it buys what you need to buy, and it circulates in the community and gets everybody else involved too. And it's that calculation. You can do it yourself. You can ask folks how to do it. But figuring out what those equivalent values are is the process of community. Yeah. How much is the farmer's food worth? How much is the cabinet, the bicycle? You know, how much is, is being able to pick it up at one spot on one day? What's that worth? And, 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 and what we've seen is uh, in this cheap economy, as cheapest price, is very shoddy quality in everything. And so I, I can tell you this, and, and, and you know the same thing. All of you probably know it. There is room for quality. There is absolutely room for quality. And, and you, can, you can actually uh, make a business that will work in the local economy if you know how to get the quality. And how to market it. If you only have one of those, you're going to fail. You've got to have both of them. You've got to figure out both of those. Because there is a niche market almost in anything. Uh, and you just have to, but you've got to get those two components. With, without, with only one of them, you can't do it. And, and sometimes I wonder if, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get them and, you know, yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a struggle to, to get them. Well, not only is there, there room for the local economy, the local economy demands it, right? It, it, when, you're, when you're operating, when you're, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're producing, whatever the production is. You get so frustrated with garbage. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. You just, and, garbage, and something you that just bad. breaks. You get it and it yeah. breaks, and so you take it back to Costco or yeah, exactly. whatever it is, you know. Exactly. And the guy who's making it locally, the guy or gal who's making it locally, they're going to know. It's like, you literally know where I sleep. <laughs> like, I need to make sure that what I'm making is of quality. And like I said, I, I brushed over these three points that I was using, but quality of the outcome, that's, it's humongous. And again, the local economy, it just it demands it. Because if I buy a shirt from somebody and I take it home and the seam rips out on me and the first time I put it on, I'm going to go over and I'm going to knock on their door and be like, why did my shirt rip? And then they're going to have to fix it. Um, so, yeah. Okay, first of all, thanks for coming. And uh, I think this idea of the, our money is something that we can vote with every day is uh, the conclusion that I came to myself through studying these types of things on my own. And uh, so this kind of goes to the whole group here because this is what I've been trying to do probably over the last three years. It's trying to find opportunities where I could spend my money to someone here in the community, and uh, it's you would be surprised about what there is out there. I, at least during the summer, it's a lot easier going to farmers markets and different things. But you know, in the, I've realized in the last month or so that everything on my plate has come within like Salt Lake County or Utah County. Good for you. Nice. And uh, awesome. it's it's a pretty yeah, that's it's awesome. if you and it you build friendships and you, it really. I don't know if you if you seek the opportunity or, or try to make those changes, it's it's here. It, there's a lot of talented people, a lot of people that are trying to do what both of you are doing. And uh, I don't know a couple places you could check is KSL. You can find people that you know honey, vegetables, fruit, you know, or all sorts of stuff. So I don't know, just get involved with the community. And you, can, I don't know, because for me that was the biggest thing. It was hard to figure out where to go because it's not obvious. We're so programmed to just go to the store, it seems like. And, that's, and I think that that's, that's a humongous thing. I just one experience that I've had with that. So uh, I like ties. I, just, I don't know why. I just like wearing ties. 
Especially bow ties, actually. I thought about wearing one today, but I usually get made fun of, so I decided not to. But uh, I and I and I was I was I wanted to buy a bow tie, and I was talking to a friend, and and he uh, he told me he's like, well, oh, you're gonna get one from that guy that makes one, or just round just like right next door to your house. I'm like, there's a guy in Provo who makes bow ties. Are you kidding me? And uh, he's like, yeah, yeah. And I like so I, I got a hold of the guy and everything, and and it was just a neat experience. It's like you said, it's it's just incredible what is actually made here. And I think that really the what needs to happen, this was a project that I was trying to work on this summer, but just, you know, that again, that whole time of, uh, you know, the whole idea of time, right, caught up with me, um, is compiling all of these places that you can go. My, my goal was to find within uh, 20 miles of the center of Provo, right, what all can you get within 20 miles of the center of Provo. Um, and just in the preliminary research, I have yet to put everything together, but in the, just in the preliminary research, you can literally almost get everything you need. Um, that you know of, of that type of major, especially food. Um, so yeah, it's it's really I think we're at the step where that needs to become more accessible information. Right. So yeah. If I could uh, ask, uh, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but <clears throat> every day when I go home from work, I pass a, a big IHC uh, facility that has a huge expanse of lawn that they water and mow. And it drives me nuts because I live up I live up probably where no one should have built the house but but anyway I, I've lost all the sunlight cuz we have I have privacy now but no no sunlight. I used to be able to put in 30 or 40 tomato plants and you can it for the winter but now now I just can't. So I, I, I it just kills me to see these big and here at UVU we've got all this grass area I just don't understand why, well, what I'd like to see, and I wish I knew how to do it, is some sort of community program where people could come in and, and till their own little area. I, I lived in Sweden for a while, and that's really common, that, that people that live in the apartment buildings, then there's these fields, you pay some kind of fee, and then you can go and work, and it's good to do the work. I didn't used to think that, but... Jeff has been teaching me. <laughs> it, I find this personally very exciting. I'm gonna, I want to become a member today, and uh, right, and I want to eat more local food. And I th I'd, I'd, I'd like to see farms all around the campus here because I, I I think it's doable. It's absolutely doable. You know, what we got thirty thousand students here. They all got to eat. And why not eat good stuff? You know, at least at least part of the year, you know. And and we, you know, what do you spend on ground maintenance for crying out loud? Mm -hmm. And the water and the, all of that is just it's absurd, really. I, well, usually, what has to happen is somebody has to taste it. You know, I I I I do all the cooking in my house, and <clears throat> when I use produce that I've raised, it's always so much better. Yeah. Than anything else. And people will say, well, what's the recipe for that? I don't know. I just threw it together. Just use good ingredients and don't mess it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so true. Yeah, everybody just needs to, at the end of the day, we just need to produce as much food as we can on our own place, really. And, and if you can't, you know, community gardens, it's a really good way to go. It is. Really good way to go. Do, we have, do you know if there are any in, in Orem and Provo? Not there, that I know of. There, there are. There is. There, there, are, there are two in Provo. Two yeah. in Provo. They're very small, but there are two in Provo. If you if you Google it, I'm sure it would come up. Okay. So yeah. Keep in mind when we're we're asking things like. Um, what about subsidies? These subsidies that you and I, through our tax dollars, we're paying billions of dollars to these enormous corporate farms. To it, what it's done is it's telling us that the, the free market does not work. That if it were up to the free market, these big businesses would not be able to survive. And what we have done by subsidizing the large corporate industrial agriculture is we've made it so our local farmers cannot survive. I used to own a, an agricultural store, and I would sell feed corn, or I, I would just sell a whole kernel corn. And it's funny, the farmers that grew corn would come in and say, I cannot grow that corn, planting the seed in the ground, and harvesting it myself for the same price that you're selling it in a 50-pound bag 
cleaned, washed, ready to eat. It's just, uh, it's an imbalance in the structure. We are taught all the time these ideas that the free market is the way to go, that we need to support you know, the free market, and we're kind of brainwashed into thinking that we actually have a free market. <laughs> if we had a free market, we would not be bailing out the big corporation, and then our local community business people, our small business people that are making quality products that are healthy and nutritious, would be able to compete, and it, we would have a local economy. If we don't have a local economy, though, our money doesn't stay here. Our money's always going to some investor, who knows, even in some other country. And our local places fall apart. We have no place to work. We have no place to support the rest of us. If, if we have a good, solid community business, then the rest of us have a place to work. Our children have a place to maybe grow up and could raise a family, building and living on a local community farm or uh, with our community businesses, farms as well as others. But let's think, you know, if I may, just one other p point is we are willing to go to the industrial agriculture, for example, or the large, huge corporate businesses that are selling us these things, and we're always searching for the lowest price. And we've, we've heard that the price is going to be a little more, the quality is going to be much better. If we do buy that locally made bow tie, it may not fall apart after six months. It might last us, who knows, the rest of the year, the rest of our lives. If we, we're, we're constantly taught, though, if you think about what the corporate message is always, when you watch the TV commercials, they're always battling over just trying to convince us you want to shop for the lowest price. Buy our product because it's cheaper. You could save 15% or more if you buy our product. Nobody talks about the quality of their product any longer. They simply are advertising on this is cheaper. We don't know what we're getting when we only buy cheaper, but we're programmed to think that way. If we just stop to think a little bit more deeply, the other you know, external costs, the long-term costs, not only that, but what has it done to our communities when we have no Main Street? We have no jobs to work in. We have no tax base. What's, what's that doing to our communities? It's destroying us in a variety of ways. So it's a change of culture, and maybe the way that the big industrial firms want us to think might not be in our best interest. Yeah, there's, a, there's another point going Please. along that is uh, you look at um, the new the next generation, I guess you'd call it, Food Safety Act, which was passed in the lame, in the lame duck session last December. Uh, and it's just absurd what, what that is uh, because um, it's all about um, scaring people about food safety so that the large corporation can get more regulation to where the small producer cannot compete at all. And, 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 and legitimizing bad behavior. Um, I did some consulting for a very large uh, carrot producer in uh, southern San Joaquin Valley. And I guarantee that everybody here has eaten one of their carrots. So uh, I'll I apologize for what I'm going to tell you, but, but anyway, okay, <laughs> just south of Bakersfield. Oh, uh, Merced, that's right. Yeah, well, this, this is a lot of carrots grown uh, just south of Bakersfield. Uh, but anyway, it's an it, absolute cesspool uh, as to how the, the washing and the, the, you know, the packaging and, and all of that, it's just, it's just this process that shouldn't be allowed, just like we shouldn't have feedlots for cattle. I mean, it's just something that should not be done because it's, it's, it's concentrating um, all of the bad things that, that, that you just don't want to have into the place where your food is. But it's cheap to do it that way, and so that's the way it's done, and then we bail it out with chemicals. And so when we get through doing all this bad behavior, then we sterilize everything, and then everything's good to go. And so... This Food Safety Act is just that. And so instead of outlawing things that should really never be done, it gives a standard as to what you do 
to make sure it's safe after you do that. And what does that do? All it does is legitimize bad behavior. And who's, who's behind the bill? The chemical companies. Because guess what? You get to sell more chemicals. <laughs> because that's what it's all about. And so that's who's behind the Food Safety Act. And we're, we're, we're uh, uh, wrought with fear about a salmonella breakout or a E. coli. And because of that, and we've seen those, then we've got to have this. And if you really stop to think about it, the reason we have those breakouts is because we've decided we have to have it sterilized. Because the, the main defense against bad uh, pathogens is bacteria. That's the buffer. And so we're going to wipe out everything. We're going to sterilize it. And so if you do have an occasion of an E. coli, there's nothing stops it. And that's why we get these, these incredible uh, problems that spread over, you know, half of the states, you know, 27, 28 states recall of this and that, and, and it killed this person because it was sterilized. And so you just go, what in the world are we doing here? And when you consider that the human body, for every cell, there's 10 bacteria. That's who we are. We're alive. <laughs> We're not sterile. And we, we, need, we need that. We need the buffer. But the whole thing of the, this new generation uh, um, Food Safety Act is sterilize, legitimize bad behavior. And that's what's going to keep our food safe. And traceability. Yeah, and the traceability to that. But what it does then to the small producer is, okay, now you need to be, be subjected to this. And on our farm, we know we got dirt on the stuff, but it's good dirt. And you know what it is. And we're coming out of a situation where everything's balanced, where we've got lots of bacteria, we've got buffers. People are not going to get sick. We didn't have these kind of breakouts when people were growing their own stuff and it was in the community. You didn't have them. This is a new, this is a new event. And th then, then you go from there to the GMOs. Does everybody know what, what GMOs are? Genetically modified food. And most countries in the world don't put up with it. The United States does uh, because of this revolving door at the highest levels of our government. Is, and so we have become the guinea pigs for uh, new kinds of proteins that have never been in food before. And then somebody all of a sudden has food allergies. Well, you know what? We, there, years ago, there weren't food allergies. They didn't exist. Why do we have them? There, there's uh, cases where you know, a child you know, gets a food allergy, and you end up tracing back, and you find out that it's this, this Franken protein that, that uh, comes you know, through the GMO. And you know, the, the, the implications of that, the, the health issues, the quality of life issues, and to think that our government sanctions that. The EU will not sanction that because we don't know what that does yet. We need to, and, and you talk to people, well, if we don't do that, we're not going to be able to feed the world. You go, have you seen how much land there is everywhere and with the technology we have? I mean, I did some numbers on the way we do agriculture because it's very intense. And with 30 sections of land, we could feed Utah. So give me a break, you know. A section is, is uh, mile by mile, mile, a square mile, 640 acres. Yeah. Out of how many? We, we, we have plenty of water. We have plenty of climate. We have, we have everything. We can feed ourselves. We can, and we should. 
we should. Well, and also on what Jeff was saying, just on the cost of things, uh, there's actually been some research that was done. And on average, when you're buying locally, um, now again, this is on average, right? So you buy a locally made table, it's gonna cost considerably more than buying it at Ikea, right? But, uh, you know, for example, just again, because we had mentioned it again on my bow tie, I should have wore it so I could make an example with it. Um, mm -hmm. That bow tie actually cost half of what, and the other bow ties that were that same thing. Like it was, it's like a reversible deal and it's like half of the cost. So on average, you're only paying 50 to 75 cents more on average to buy locally. That's it. That's the difference. On the margin, there's not that much difference. Yeah. That, that's what is so amazing about yeah. the whole thing. On the margin, yeah. there's not that much difference, yeah. but the, the difference is so dramatic for the community. It, yeah, and it's, yeah, it makes an incredible difference for the community, and it's because we've been, I guess, what was it, brainwashed, I think is the word we used. <laughs> it's because we've been, yeah, like hoodwinked, we've been trained, <laughs> whatever we want to call it, to always look for the bottom dollar, to always look cheap. at wh how cheap it is. And so, well, I, you know, this bundle of carrots or, you know, this whatever, you know, I can get it for like 70 more cents, you know, 70 less cents at the grocery store, so I'm just going to get it there. And, you know, then all that money leaves the community. So, and you're poisoning yourself and poisoning everything else around you. One last point, how about, please? Um, like you were saying about the seeds not being able, you can't propagate them, you can't plant them, um, coming from the big corporations. Um, I came from here from Montana and the biggest, most important thing for the small farmer in Montana were our seed banks. Do we have something similar like that in Utah that is local, is accessible to the local community for heirloom and heritage seeds for the small farmers? I'm not aware of anything organized. There's a lot of people that are involved in seed saving. And there's, there's several national organizations that most people belong to. And so directly in the state of Utah as an organization, I'm not aware of one. There may be. I'm not aware of it.